So I want to uh, continue with uh, the series that started last week when Jess, I heard, preached an epic message. Kate and I were in Nashville, uh, sorry, in Manchester, Tennessee, preaching at a, at a church, um, Pentecostal church, which is an amazing time. Uh, but she preached the first of this series, We the Church, We the People, We the Church, the People of the Church. And um, your phone is just here, doll. And, uh, and so my, my job this morning is to pre teach and preach, and the title of my message is Earnestly Desire the Spiritual Gifts. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, and I'll be drawing from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, although we're not going to read them all because we don't have time, but I would really encourage you to spend time in the Scriptures reading those um, as I have in the preparation of this message. Uh, there's just so much richness in there. But I want to start at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read a few of the verses of this passage uh, because we're going to preach from it. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there, there are varieties of activities, but it is, this, it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Or, in the King James Version, says empowers all in all. Yes. Amen. Now I want to pause just there for a moment because one of the things that has been taught in the church all over the world and for many centuries, an alternative teaching is that they focused on a verse that comes a little bit later which says that the Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit works some in some. But he starts by saying, all in all. So, all in all means all in all. Okay. So, just so that you know, if you are born again and born of the Spirit, it is impossible for you to not say Jesus is Lord. And if you can say Jesus is Lord, then that means he's the Lord of your life. That means he recognizes your submission. And therefore, he trusts you because he sees that you're under his authority. He trusts you to carry and be his authority in the earth. And that means that the Holy Spirit, who's the Spirit of Jesus, is, has already given you the capacity of all of the gifts to operate in each of you. Just imagine what the church of Jesus Christ would look like all across the world if every single believer, at least a billion and even maybe up to two billion of us, actually understood that God the Holy Spirit has given all the gifts to all of us. He works all in all. You have the capacity to all the gifts. However... Because you're under his lordship, he reserves the right to lead you by the Spirit into the operation of each of those gifts according to his will and according to the context in which you're in. But he's not going to bring you into a context that you're not gifted to address. He's not going to lead you into a context which it requires you to work a miracle only it's him, not you. And then you discover in that context, oh, actually it's my buddy who, uh, who should be here because I don't have that gift. That's not his way. He knows that for us to operate in the fullness of his will and in accordance to walking by the Spirit, he had to give us the capacity for all in all. Now, that's, now that that's established, we can move on. 
To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for the good of everybody. That's what it means by the common good, the good of all of us. So all in all for all y'all. All in all for all y'all. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. In other words, all have been given, all in all, for all y'all. But you don't start to see the manifestation until you get into the mission. And as you get into the mission, now all of a sudden he apportions according to his will, according to the context of the need of your mission. There's no point in being upset that you don't have the gift of tongues if you're not on a mission that requires tongues. You've already been given the gift of tongues in the Spirit, but you won't be released until you're in the mission of tongues. What is the mission of tongues? The edification of yourself. So if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to receive the gift of tongues, and by the way, tongues is one of the signs of the gifts of the Spirit, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the only manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to be if you want to walk in tongues and have the gift of tongues, then spending time in the secret place in prayer, you will quickly start to get baptized in the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. We've had a hundred years of the rediscovery of the gift of tongues, but the danger of it is, is that we pigeonhole it into one experience. I remember, for example... I was baptized in the Holy Spirit many years ago when I was 21 years old. And, uh, but many years later, I was in a nation called Kyrgyzstan. And I was getting ready to minister. And the Holy Spirit whacked me, crashed into me so hard. He knocked me off my feet. I landed on the ground, rolling around in the dust. And it was a very dusty church. It didn't have a carpet like this. It was just concrete and it was covered in dust. My clothes were covered in dust. I'm out of, I'm laughing, laughing, laughing so hard. I'm getting electrocuted. I'm just completely overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. In my mind, I'm thinking, Duncan, you don't have many sets of clothing. You're wasting one of them right now. What are you doing? Get up out of this dust. But I'm rolling around, I'm covered in dust. And as I begin to roll around covered in dust, spontaneously I start to yell out, Bajenge, Buzungu, Baranga, Babalolua. Like this. Over and over and over. What was a new tongue? I'd never spoken any of those. I came back. I, before I say, go on, I noticed from that moment that in every meeting that I was in, if I said, Bajenge, Buzungu, Baranga, Babalolua, explosion of the Holy Spirit would happen in the room. When I got back to Toronto, I had my newfound tongue. And I'm like, I'm like saying that quite often. Kate and I end up going to Detroit not long after, about six months after. I had no idea what I was saying. I just knew that heaven broke out. And in this particular meeting, I'm yelling out, Bajenge, Buzungu, Baranga, Babalolu. Well, these three black ladies came up to me from Southern Africa. Sorry, I didn't, I said came up to me. They came up to Kate, I'm sorry. Came up to Kate and said, um, Pastor, your husband, where did he learn how to speak uh, our tribal South African languages? And Kate goes, he doesn't. He only knows how to speak Hausa. And so they said, well, He's, he's speaking our tribal tongue. And he's saying the same word in all three of our different tribal tongues. But it's the same meaning. So Kate's like, you better come and meet my husband. So of course, you know, she comes up and 
you know, gets in the, interrupts the prayer line up, and rightly so, and she says, honey, you got to meet these three amazing African ladies. She tells, they, they, you know, she quickly tells me and summarizes me. I'm like, what am I saying? And they said, you're saying white people, white people, white people, <laughs> while I practically fainted. I'm like... Quick as a, f I said, you're kidding me. They start laughing like all you guys are laughing. And they're like, yeah, but we don't know what the last word is. We don't know what babalolua means. That's another language. We have no clue what that means. But you're for sure saying in each of our tribal language, white people, white people, white people. I said to the Lord, Lord, what in the world does this mean? Quick as a flash, the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit, he talks at the speed of light? Actually, He's just corrected me. No, he doesn't. He talks at the speed of thought, which is even quicker. And he said to me, Duncan, you're not white. And I looked at myself and I thought, you're right. I'm kind of like a browny, slightly pink, orangey kind of texture. So I found out on my DNA test, I've got Turkish Israeli as my DNA. Who'd have thought? I got to Norway. I thought they were my people. No, turns out I've got zero DNA from Norway. <laughs> Turkish, Israeli. Wow. Antioch's in Turkey, full of Israelis. Anyway, that's another matter. So having established the fact in that split second that I'm not white, and that actually there are no white people, every single human being has pigment, I realized that they weren't referring, I wasn't referring to humans. And quick as a flash, the Holy Spirit said, the only white people are the angels. Nothing to do with race, but to do with the brilliance of the light emanating from angels. And he said, I gave you a tongue to call the angels. That's why, and I realized in that moment, oh, oh no wonder things happen when I say, Bajenge Bozungu Baranga. White people, white people, white people. Not referring to race of this earth, we're calling the angels. And it's just like God because he's so fun that he just said, I'm going to give you a tongue for that. I'm not going to have you going around going, white people, white people, white people. That might be a little embarrassing. But I had no idea what Baba Lulu meant. And in fact, I got a little thrown off because I found out that Babalu means is a nasty uh, principality from the Yoruba tribe in uh, Nigeria and uh, a whole religion that worships this god Babalu. So now I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope I'm not saying that. But then I'm like, but I'm not saying Babalu, I'm saying Babalolu. And I know enough about Nigerian languages and African languages in general to know that Babalu might, and Babalolu might sound similar to us who speak English or another language, but to a Yoruba person, Babalu and Babalolu is totally different. Well, I said, Lord, I really want to know what Babalolu means. And I get to, Niger I get to Niger, Niger Republic, a few uh, months later, and I'm... I'm telling my friend, a Norwegian apostle, and I'm telling him all about this. And he says, well, come on, don't, let's go and chat with our Nigerian apostles. Let's go and, let's go and ask them because they're from the Yoruba tribe. I'm like, okay, cool. So we go to them and, and we're like, uh, so my friend says, so uh, what, is, what does the word babalu mean? And they're like, oh, that's not good. That's like a false god, false religion. Don't want to say it. And I'm like, yeah. And so he's like, what does Babalolu mean? And they're like, oh, and there's three of them. They're like, oh, Babalolu, Babalolu. Oh, yeah. That means my daddy is the Lord my God. Come on. All right. So let's just put that together. Angels, 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 come now because my daddy's the Lord my God. Okay, now we understand, okay, that the gift of tongues 
is for the edification of the saints. And that edification is so supernatural that you will birth the supernatural when you speak in tongues on your behalf wherever you are. Tomorrow morning, some of you are going to be at work. Almost all of you are going to be at work. Your workplace will never be safe if you get activated in tongues. It's going to be a dangerous place for anybody who steps in there, including all your bosses. Because you have the capacity in you to bring heaven into that room. And let me tell you something. Bill Johnson taught us that heaven wants to invade earth. And the Holy Spirit woke me up and he said, and by the way, Bill's right. I intend for heaven to invade earth, but the purpose of heaven invading earth, Duncan, is so that all of heaven desires, all of earth desires nothing but heaven. God doesn't want to invade this world to make this world a better place alone. God, the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son wants to break in in this world so that this world no longer desires this world, but desires him desires Jesus so that he truly becomes who he is, the desire of the nations. What is the purpose of all the spiritual gifts to reveal Jesus, to make him the desire of the nations? And God wants to work all the gifts in all y'all in order that Jesus be glorified so that you are in the glory and you carry the glory and you reveal the glory of God. Now, I'd like you to just put that, if the team could just put the, um, put the, man, I need a haircut. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got one tomorrow. All right, here we go. Kate and I's friend, dear friend, been a friend for many years, Naomi. Fennel, who's right here on the front rope, has been part of Iris for many years and also is from the well in the UK where she's an amazing leader. Stand up, actually, Naomi. Give everyone a wave. <laughs> Naomi, Naomi made this slide, and she's staying with Kate and I for a, a few days. And, uh, and so she said, oh, I've got, a, I've got a slide on the spiritual gifts. I'm like, you do? She goes, yeah, you want to see it? I take one look at it. I'm like, that's so good. I want the church to see that. So go ahead, all y'all. Take your cameras out. Take a picture of that, and then you've got it. Okay, what she's done is she's taken something that Dr. Mark Verkler, uh, who's an amazing man of God, put together, in which Dr. Mark Verkler has put the gifts of the Spirit into a helpful set of categories so that all the gifts that you can flow in, you understand they have a flow. They have a order of operation. Now, I came into realizing this by an amazing um, leader from Kensington Temple. Kate, what was his name? Um, from London. Can't think of his name, but anyway. Colin Dye. Thank you very much. Colin Dye. He taught us. Put those back up, please. He taught us. Oh, there, there, there. There, there. That's fine. That's there. I didn't realize that, team. That's no problem. You can take them off. There they are. All right. He taught us, okay, that, for example, the revelatory gifts, they flow in an order, all right? Now, they're not in the order right here that he put them in, but I want to put them in. For example, okay, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, chapter, uh, verse 1, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you prophesy. And then he goes on to explain why, especially that you prophesy, because he helps us by seeing his heart and the Holy Spirit's heart regarding prophecy, what is the heart of God regarding all the spiritual gifts, that all the spiritual gifts are not for you. Amen. They're for us. Amen. And they're for the world. And that actually as we begin to learn how to flow with them all, we flow with them all not searching to use them for our own significance, but to use them for the significance of Jesus. There's nothing that will lead you into a greater pitfall and a greater blockage of the flow of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts being used through you and in you than when you start to attach yourself to those gifts. Wow, I'm a prophet. I actually speak in multiple tongues. 
And by the way, my gift of interpretation, blow you all away. <laughs> yep, oh, and did I let you know how many miracles I've done recently? Man, I've done so many miracles, it's just amazing. Stage four cancers have been healed. Foods multiplied. I mean, it's just amazing. Blind eyes have opened, and I mean, on and on and on. And it's just so amazing how God uses me, and I just give myself, I mean, Jesus, all the glory. There's nothing that pollutes the spirit more than that kind of wrongful attachment of ourselves and our search for significance to what belongs only to Jesus. I like, I like what uh, we, we, we were chatting to one of our friends yesterday, and uh, he said when he joined this church, he met Murray, and he, he called him Pastor Murray, and Murray said, oh no, please don't call me Pastor Murray. I mean... I don't know what you do, but if you're an electrician, you wouldn't really want to be Electrician William, would you? <laughs> so that's why we don't want you to call us Pastor Duncan, Pastor Kate. I mean, obviously, if you want to do it out of, out, you know, out of just the goodness of your heart and in the right context in the moment, you're kind of honoring us, maybe public, whatever. We're not going to say, hey, stop that. But we're, Jess and Aaron don't want you to call them Pastor Jess, Pastor Aaron. As tempting as it might be for them to desire that, we never want our titles to be anything more than son of God, daughter of God. Okay? So the spiritual gifts, when we eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, the reason we're to eagerly desire them is because he's just said all of that right after 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, where he said, love is the key. It's all about love. You can have faith to move mountains. You can have all kinds of tongues. You can do all kinds of amazing miracles. But if you don't have love, you're just a resounding doing. All of heaven's like, oh. But if you have love, you're going to earnestly desire those spiritual gifts. Why? So that the manifestation of those gifts is for the common good. It's that everybody around you is blessed. Now, what is the best context for the gifts of the Spirit to be operating in? Your connect groups. If you're not in a connect group, you're probably not going to be experiencing the maximum level of other people's prophetic gifts and spiritual gifts, other spiritual gifts, being given to you. You're also going to be starved of your opportunity to give your spiritual gifts away to others. We don't want you to be in a connect group for our sakes as your leaders. We want you to be in a connect group for your sakes. We want you to serve in a ministry in this church for your sakes and for the sake of the body of Christ, for the enrichment of all of us. I love it that every week parents and people serve in the kids' ministry. I love it that people, young adults, leaders, serve in the youth ministry. I love it that people serve in the prayer ministry. The prayer ministry team's been relaunched since the pandemic. It's just fantastic. What an opportunity for you to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, you can't just walk up and join that prayer ministry team because we want the prayer ministry team to be filled with a group of people that have showed themselves to be excellent in spirit. And so there's going to be a little training and so on and so forth. But don't get all bent out of shape that, you know, oh man, I, they don't recognize my gift. Understand it just is to make this place a safe place. The nice thing is that means that everybody who's ministering to you is a person that knows how to flow in the Holy Spirit for your sakes and the Lord's sakes. And I could go on and on in various different areas of ministry. It's all for the body of Christ. And Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 12, he goes on to talk about, you know, the hand. He likens the body of Christ to our physical bodies with regards to the spiritual gifts. He's like, the hand doesn't come along and go, oh my gosh, I wish I was a foot. I need to be a foot. Yeah, because otherwise you'd walk on your hands, wouldn't you? Exactly, Antoine. And that would just, just not look that comfortable. And, you know, the, the, the shoulder doesn't turn around and say, I want to be the eye. You know? And, and so the whole point of the body is that we're all different, everybody. Because each member of the body is different deliberately in order to serve the rest of the body with what the rest of the body doesn't have. Diversity is never, sorry, excuse me, let me say that. Unity is never conformity. See? 
But you'd be surprised how we get that muddled up. True unity is really diversity. Why? Because it's in the areas that we're different that our greatest opportunity to give a gift of love to somebody else is right there. In the difference. In the difference. We want to... You know, I, I look around right now and Catch the Fire has changed so much in 14 years. I look around, I see all the nations represented in here. Thank God! People say that in, that, that in America, segregation is alive and well and the place you can see it the best is in church on Sunday mornings. Well, let me tell you, by the grace of God, not in Catch the Fire. Not in Catch the Fire. You know why? Because we all have one Father. And you know why? Because we celebrate that we're all different. And you know why? Because we recognize that our differences is a love gift to each other. Shaka Rabba. Please. Apart from Christ in me, please do not try to be me. I actually haven't seen any of you try to be me anyway. But do you get what I'm saying? Be yourself in Christ Jesus. Now, you can imitate me, but only as I imitate Christ, Paul says. Okay, now, I want to just finish by, by saying this, okay? That there are two areas that the church of Jesus Christ through history and up till today stumble in, which is the greatest limiting factor, I believe, in the church fulfilling its destiny. And the destiny of the church is to be a supernatural people of God on the earth demonstrating that God is alive, that Jesus has risen from the dead because he's doing in and through us things that only God can do. The problem is, if you take the supernatural away from the church, the only thing that the church has left to show the world that Jesus Christ is Lord, is arguments. And arguments will never win the world. You will never, you are, or let me say it like this, you are highly unlikely to win a person who's a follower of Islam and the teachings of Muhammad. You will be highly unlikely to lead them to Jesus if you try to do it by arguing. And, or by comparing their book with your book, our book. If you try to do that, you'll probably lose the battle. Why? Because they probably know their book better than you. But let me tell you, if you surrender your right to argue, and instead, you know you've got the word on the inside of you, you're not going to try to defend it, you're not going to try to manifest it per se in that moment, in an argument way, argumentative way, you're simply going to serve their felt need in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you do that, let me tell you something. If, if you're with somebody who's a follower of another religion, and you say, or an atheist, or anybody else for that matter who's not a follower of Jesus, if you were to say to them, when they say, if you were to say to the Holy Spirit, what is it, Holy Spirit, that you know is going on in their life that's a felt need? And the Holy Spirit says to you, their five-year-old son is sick and on the point of death. And you turn around, okay, that's the word of knowledge. When God shows you something that you cannot know yourself by your natural mind, that is the word of knowledge. It is not prophecy. It is the word of knowledge, a different gift of the Spirit. What's the next thing you do? You immediately ask the one who gave you the word of knowledge to give you a word of wisdom. Okay, Lord, now that you've told me that the five-year-old is not, is not well and they're about to die, would you show me how and what to do? Right now! That would be good. And the Lord will give you a word of wisdom. And whatever that word of wisdom is, you act upon it. Number three, you, will dis you ask, God, would you operate the gift, not only of knowledge, word of knowledge, but also word of wisdom, but also discerning of spirits? Would you help me to know what spirits are operating right into this situation? And right in that moment, the Holy Spirit says to you, boom, just like that. That five-year-old has a fear of death. That five-year-old has been plagued by multiple nightmares their whole life. And before you minister to, the, to them for their sickness, you need to deal with that first. 
Okay, Lord, give me the words to say. That's the prophecy now. Now you move into prophecy. But the way you move into prophecy is not to take the moment for yourself. And how amazingly supernatural you are by saying, thus says the Lord, your five-year-old is really sick and it's to do with nightmares and all of this and, 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 and you need to leave that religion because there's all of that that's going on. And, and No. You don't take the temptation, you don't fall to the temptation of using the moment of supernatural to gain significance. And the best way to avoid that is to ask a question. Can I ask you something? Do you have any children? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I have four. Oh, awesome. You have a, do you have any that are... What ages are, you, are they? Oh, and one of them's five. Oh, yeah, I, I thought that because I just sensed in my spirit, you're five-year-old. They're really sick right now. Would that be true? Yes. How did you know? Well... Because God showed me. Because God loves you and God loves your five-year-old. And I've got some great news for you. There is power in the name of Jesus. Who's in, who's that, whose name is in your Quran? Isa. And would you, would you allow me to minister right now with you for God? To heal your sick child and raise them up. Have they had an issue with nightmares? Oh my gosh, they've had nightmares their whole life. Have they been afraid of dying? Yes. Okay, let's start there. Heavenly Daddy, in the name of Isa, Yeshua HaMashiach, we break the power of that spirit of death that is holding your beloved son and daughter's child in this sickness. And we command healing virtue to flow to them right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 30 seconds. Bing! They get a text. <gasps> the child is up. They jumped out of bed. They're running downstairs to the refrigerator right now taking a glass of milk. Okay, I made all of that up, but you understand what I'm saying. There's a flow to the spiritual gifts. And that flow is not for you to be significant. It's a flow for the power of God to be revealed so that the love of God can touch the world around you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, two things have really held the church up. Number one is that verse in 1 Corinthians 13. Sorry, I just had a a blank moment. 1 Corinthians and chapter 13 says this in verse 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will cease. They will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. One of the biggest things that's hindered the church is this. That the church has believed for centuries that the spiritual gifts ended with the apostles. Let me tell you, I humbly say to you today, catch the fire, that that is wrong doctrine and wrong theology. And here's how I know why. Because none of those spiritual gifts was the gift of the apostles. It was not something the apostles brought to the world that died when the apostles died. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is alive today as much as he was then. And he's the one who's operating the spiritual gifts. So the gifts are, to today, are for today. They're operating ready in you, ready for your mission context. And how do we know that? Because the hypocrisy is this. It's, they say, those people who believe that say this. They say, see, it says in Scripture that prophecy will cease, that tongues will cease because loves come. That's the context. Except they conveniently leave out that knowledge will cease. And they're still having their Bible studies. And it's this pursuit of knowledge that betrays that knowledge absolutely has not ceased. And they know it. So if knowledge hasn't ceased, neither is tongues, neither is prophecy. That's good Bible exegesis. If you're going to believe that tongues have ceased, if you're going to believe that prophecy ceased, then you need to stop gaining knowledge. Right. Right. 
Second thing is the last verse, verse 40 of 1 Corinthians 14, that simply says this, let all things be done in decency and in order. If the gifts of the Spirit had died with the apostles, why is the church around the world still trying to do everything in decency and in order, considering that the things that that's written of, the decency and in order, have passed away with the apostles? If they've passed away with the apostles, there's no need for decency and order concerning the spiritual gifts. Think about it. Why is verse 40 there? Everything, including the spiritual gifts, must be in decency and order. Why does Paul say that? Because the spiritual gifts will never end until Jesus comes back. And he hasn't come back yet. So, let's all stand. Decency and order, everybody, is not the decency and the order that you think it is when you first think of those words. You see, a plantation, a man-made plantation, has everything in rows. How many of you have seen that? Avocados all grown in rows, palm oils all grown in, in rows, uh, teak and mahogany all grown in rows, pine trees, Christmas trees all in rows, everything looks the same, correct? That's man-made order. God-made order is a rainforest, a jungle. Man-made order, there's very low biodiversity. But in the, in the things that God makes, which is not plantations per se, that he co-labors with us, but things that just he's made that we've had nothing to do, rainforests, jungles, the order under the surface is so profound that if you just take out one or two species, the entire biodiversity of that community and ecosystem will tumble down like a thread being pulled out of a, a jersey. So when you see the Holy Spirit at work and it looks like chaos, just like a jungle and a rainforest look like chaos, just remember the Holy Spirit knows everything is in decency and order. He knows what he's doing in each of us. He knows what he's doing. But if we turn around and make it about us that we know what we're doing, we'll make everything in nice rows everywhere. And there'll be no evidence of the Spirit anywhere. And we'll all look the same instead of looking like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're all different from one another, yet one. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. Get in and go for it. You are full of the Holy Spirit. Give your gifts away.